It's been a sizzling summer in my central Texas garden. When the going gets tough and some plants get going to the compost, there's one summer flower that won't be deterred. With endless blooms, a wide array of colors, and a true romance with pollinators, butterflies, and hummingbirds, zinnias are the best summer flowers. Check out these awesome varieties that I'm growing this season. I'll share my tips for how to get tons of flowers, best planting practices, how to extend the season, and more. What's up everyone? It's Scott from New Garden Road, always out here to inform, inspire, and elevate you. Encouraging biodiversity and restoring habitat is my mission, one garden at a time. Oh yeah, what a stunner. This is the Red Beauty variety. I got these from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Typically by the end of summer, the plants will get really tall, probably five to six feet. I really love the deep color that these flowers have. They are varied a little bit. And also as they age, you'll see some difference in their color tones. When you've got a really long, hot summer and you're growing a bunch of stuff and it's kind of like a sea of green, or hopefully it's a sea of green. When you've got something this bright, it really pops in the garden. This is my third season growing the giant purple zinnia and I think I got these from Botanical Interest. These truly are a really large flower probably four inches across and that bright purple color you just can't beat it and I just love purple I really think it's probably my favorite color and here we have the golden red this is a series from true leaf really unique the blooms don't seem to be quite as large as some of the other varieties that I've got growing and in this bed alongside some watermelons I'm growing a cactus mix zinnia this came from San Diego seed company you talk about infatuation I got it bad for these They're are so beautiful. They've got some different colors here, some pink, yellow, orange, and off-white. I think one of my favorite attributes about this variety is how they change over the course of several days after they begin to bloom. Their colors will change subtly and their texture, the petals of the flower will kind of curl and flare out. So you'll notice some changes throughout the course of the week and I think that just makes for a really dynamic and beautiful garden. All right, you talk about die-hard plant varieties. This is the yellow Peruvianas it's a much smaller one in terms of the bloom size and the plant overall but look at it it's growing straight from the mulch sheer, completely unamended soil. It volunteered from last season, and I think it probably volunteered from the season before that, if not going back three or four years. You can't complain about something that volunteers in these extreme conditions. I mean, I'm not even watering this plant. Going through the catalog for Southern Exposure, I was really excited when I found a red Peruviana. I actually like how the, the flower color fades to kind of like a dusty red. So I hope that this one will begin volunteering just like the yellow variety, a really easy to maintain and beautiful flower. I certainly recommend succession planting of these flowers. They're gonna give you a cascade of color and flowers and you're gonna really enjoy them. You're gonna want more. I always want more. I wanna to talk to you about the concept of deadheading. Essentially what that indicates is when the flower that has bloomed passes its prime or starts to look like it's dying, you're going to remove it altogether. There's a specific way that you can do that which will help to ensure future blooms. This does a really good job to maintain the aesthetics of your plantings, but also it's going to prioritize the energy of the plant into the new developing blooms. I think it's fairly straightforward when you study these plants, you can see it forks off to the left and right there, and that is where you will begin to see new blooms forming. If we follow it up, we see this bloom here. It looks really pretty right now, it's doing great, but at some point it will start to decline and if you go to the base of it at that split, that's where you want to prune it out. The energy flow and the stem, instead of going up, it's going to branch out to those new blooms. Knowing exactly when to deadhead or remove a spent bloom can vary. I don't think there's necessarily a wrong answer because if you harvest them early, they make great cut flowers. And I want to talk about that coming up, but also there are other ways that you can utilize them in your landscape, in your garden space that you may like to employ. And I want to show you how I like to make these as offerings to my Buddha. Some of the things that I look for, you know, they, they don't look as good. There's been some damage. They've started to fade. Their color is different. You see the zinnias when they when they start, they don't have a whole lot of that ring of small yellow flowers that come up in the middle. That develops a little bit later. So that can be a good indicator. When you see one that has gone through its cycle, such as this, I think it's just fine to prune that out. And then you're gonna get new blooms. 
I want to talk about my intentional plant spacing and design here. There are eight of them going down the middle of this raised bed and that allows for easier access to the lower growing plants. I have interplanted them with peanuts. The peanuts are on the left and the right side and I just like that configuration. That's my personal preference. It's more of a, a showcase. A few other plant selections that would be good to interplant with your zinnias might be melons such as these cantaloupes here. Watermelons are also a good choice. I've got the cactus mix zinnias interplanted with some orange glow watermelons. One year I planted some zinnias with some southern peas, one of my favorites, the big red ripper, and those peas climb really vigorously. They started climbing up the zinnia plants so that created some issues. You have a lot of options and I think planting the zinnias in the center of raised beds, if you have enough width on them, such as four feet, you're going to have space to interplant other edible crops. You'll be drawing in wildlife, pollinators, beneficial insects, and creating beauty. I think that staking your zinnia plants can be really beneficial. The style that I like to plant them in the center of these beds, interplanted with other crops, you want to ensure that the plant spacing you're allocating for them is maintained through their growth. These plants will get kind of unwieldy. A lot of times they'll lay down, fall over, start growing up sideways, they'll find the sun. So you don't have to stake them, but I think that it does give them some integrity. And when we stake these plants, we can ensure they won't lay down down and suffocate some of the other adjacent plantings. This creates a better pattern of air circulation as well as just keeping them more beautiful and upright. Very simple concept here. You can use a variety of materials to accomplish the same end. You can see I've started off with a pretty small bamboo stake. This was originally a four foot bamboo stake. I've used some of these plastic clips here that are reusable. You can use plant tie, you can use twine, you can use a green garden stake. A lot of times I need to bump up to that as the plants Grow, you can see here they get pretty tall. I think it's good to start early in their growth. You want to stake them up high on the plant. This is actually a variety I didn't highlight for you. It's a red spider zinnia, similar to the Peruviana. It's completely laid down here. I never staked it. You can see how it has essentially corrected itself. The branches, the flowers are growing upright. If you wanted to stake something like this, it might look quite strange. You could do it, you could also prune it back, but I think that underscores the importance of staking your plants early in the season. All right, and talking about the best watering method, I have to say drip irrigation or second to that a soaker hose is definitely the option that I would choose. You want slow, deep saturation of the soil. You really need to avoid getting the leaves and the plant itself wet. You want all that water to go to the soil and slowly soak in. If you are gonna water by hand, you can check out something like this Dram water wand. It's about 32 inches long. It's got a nice shutoff valve on it. You can control the flow of water. You can put that nozzle down close to the base of the plants and that way you'll be targeting where you deliver water. Now I use drip irrigation but I will also offer supplemental moisture with my water wand. So I'm doing both. Just remember those principles and whatever system you choose, give them regular irrigation. So I've talked about some of the recommended methods for watering these zinnias, and I wanna tell you about why. One of the reasons is you can reduce the occurrence of disease. I do believe this is alternaria leaf spot. There's a bacterial leaf spot that looks a little bit different. I haven't seen that one in my garden. Also powdery mildew, that's a very common one. There are some great biological fungicides that you can apply proactively throughout the season to help reduce the spread of these diseases, but I will say that they're very common. It's not unusual to see some. This is the organic fungicide that I like to utilize on a regular basis. It's called the Monterey Complete Disease Control. A couple of pro tips here. You see I've written the application rate in Sharpie. Nice quick reference. Flip it over to the back and I have put the date of acquisition on the bottle. That way I know how old it is. This is something that I need to keep inside. I can't keep it in my shed or garage or a hot place. You want it to be in a controlled environment. It's a biological fungicide. That's really important because it actively replaces some of the bad biology that you're trying to discourage in those diseases we talked about. This product doesn't work for everything and it surely doesn't eradicate these funguses and diseases altogether, but it can help to keep them under control. I like to apply this regularly with my foliar applications. I'll do it early in the morning, but I will apply this and mix it together with seaweed and fish emulsion. That way I'm feeding, tonifying, 
and helping to prevent disease proliferation. And by foliar application, I mean you're spraying the fungicide on the leaves. You can use something as simple as a little hand sprayer like this, or if you have a large garden, you might need a pressurized sprayer. If you live in a hot climate like I do, or you're just going through a heat wave, you may consider employing some shade cloth. I like to target that in a fashion where the southwest sun, which is the hottest, most searing sun, is limited. Whereas on the east side, I've got it open. That's because morning sun is more gentle, more beneficial. When you're constructing your shade cloth cover, which is important, you don't want the shade cloth to sit directly on the plants. It can damage them, it can impede their development. Think about these zinnias. They grow pretty tall, pretty upright, continuously. And if you do something like this, where it's open and higher on this east side, you have better access, you can see them more clearly, you can maintain them. So you might have to get creative. This can help you extend the season for your zinnias. It can help reduce moisture stress. And it's something that you can utilize throughout the garden on a variety of crops all year round. Zinnias make superb cut flowers. If you pick them at the right time, the right stage, they can last for a week or more inside. What I like to do is, along with employing the same principles for deadheading, harvest them early in the morning before you get into the heat of the day when you might get some moisture stress. They might not last as long if you pick them in the middle of a hot sunny day. And again, we talked about their cycle. As they begin to open up before they get fully open, that can be a prime time to harvest them. You don't necessarily wanna pick one that's kind of later in the stages. It's not gonna last as long. So I mentioned you know, utilizing the flowers that I've deadheaded as an offering to my Buddha. This is just a mindfulness practice, creating a sacred space in the garden. That's one of the reasons I like to garden. This is a place for me to unwind, de-stress, observe nature, take a deep breath. And so developing these practices, regardless of whether or not they're tied to a specific, you know, religious or spiritual affiliation, it's just something that you can enact and it will become a mindful practice. After I remove the spent blooms from my flowers, I'll trim them up so that they're pretty short. This is when you kind of let go and just move through this process. Creatively, intuitively arrange them, whether or not it's a statue or some type of bird bath or a rock garden, whatever it is you have, however this might apply to you, consider this because this gives a second use for these flowers. Now, they're not gonna stay up and look good for very long, but this is not about something permanent. This is about a moment, and when you create this, I think it really can be enriching. Raise your level of awareness to the garden and how you can appreciate it. And again, you're just creating a space that can be special. With endless blooms, a wide array of... Okay. Woo, that is hot. Oh my goodness. Oh Lord, I'm gonna put that down. Think that was any good? Now check out more awesome gardening videos on my channel. Like this video and follow New Garden Road for weekly content. You can grow your own awesome zinnias. Keep it organic.